Hello, I'm Joseph Abruzzo, your Clerk of the Circuit Court and Comptroller. It is my privilege to introduce our amazing clerks team who will be conducting this webinar designed to help you navigate through the Palm Beach County court system. For years, these seminars were conducted at our courthouse locations. Now we're bringing these sessions online so you can watch live and ask questions. This session is being recorded and will be shared on our website, our YouTube channel, and our social media accounts. You can follow us at Clerk PBC on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. We invite you to go back to the recording of this session if there are any points you need to review again. Thank you for watching. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome to the Clerk of the Circuit Court and Comptroller's monthly self-service workshop. Um, today we are going to be about guardianship and guardian advocacy. Um, just a few housekeeping rules before we begin. Um, everybody has been muted. Um, if you do have a question um, that you need answered before the end of the presentation, you can go ahead and um, text it into the chat. I will try to monitor it, but I am thinking, um, and navigating the PowerPoint presentation. Um, but I will do my best to um, question. Otherwise, I do have time carved out at the end of the presentation for a Q&A, and I'll make sure to answer any questions at that time. Um, in addition, every as I mentioned, everyone has been muted. You can use your rate and you can use your raise hand feature if you'd like to speak your question instead of um, type it, and then we can unmute at the end of the presentation so you can ask, ask your questions. Um, this workshop is being recorded, so a few days after the presentation, it should be available on our website and our YouTube channel for someone that couldn't make it or you just wanted to rewatch a portion of it because you had any questions. And this PowerPoint presentation that we're going over is already available on our website. Um, so you can always refer to that to the links at the end of the presentation um, at any time on our website. So what we're going to cover today, I'm going to give you a very brief overview of our office and our responsibilities, particularly what we do at our self-service center. We're going to talk about some important legal terms to know when it comes to guardianship law. We're going to talk about the different types of guardians, who can be a guardian, what are the powers and the duties of a guardian? And we're also gonna talk about some alternatives to guardianship. If guardianship doesn't seem to exactly fit your situation, there are some other legal options that um, allow you to assist someone with making important decisions or managing their affairs without rising to the level of a guardianship. Finally, our helpful links that um, may be of assistance to you if you are interested in requesting a guardianship for um, someone. And I will open it up to questions at the end, as I mentioned before. Um, so briefly, the clerk in the comptroller's office, we are the keeper of the court's public records and of uh, the county's public records and public funds. And one of the duties, we, we are assigned many duties in Florida statute, and one of them is to provide um, procedural information and material assistance to self-represented litigants, so people who do not have an attorney. And one of the ways we do that is by having self-service centers. And at our self-service center, we have user-friendly form packets that we have created. There are over 80 packets available for purchase, um, on everything from divorce, landlord tenant eviction, small claim. Um, we use um, Supreme Court and Florida bar forms or local forms made by our court, but we create instructions to you and in filling them out, as well as checklists and other resources available that um, can help you kind of navigate the case from beginning to end. Um, we do have two physical self-service centers at our main branch and our South County branch where we have public access computers where you can research your case, um, look up the docket in your case. Um, and we have an e-filing station um, where you can even e-file documents if you are interested. We have a navigator program where we have navigators that can assist you to complete most of the packets that we sell at our self-service center. These are free navigator appointments. Um, 
that you can make by calling our office or coming to our office in person. And I'll give you more information about how to do that at the end of the presentation. Um, uh, we have notary services and uh, referrals and resources to justice partners and community agencies that may be able to help you with your situation. So those are some of the things that we offer to assist self-represented litigants at the self-service center. I would like to note, however, that we can give procedural and ministerial assistance. The clerk's office is not allowed to give legal advice. So if you need advice on anything, um, especially relating to a guardianship case, we would suggest that you seek the advice of an attorney. And in our packets, we also have information about the lawyer referrals um, service for Palm Beach County, the Florida Bar, um, legal aid, and other agencies in our community. So that's a little bit about what we do. And now let's talk about guardianship and what a guardianship, what a guardian is. Basically, guardianship is a legal proceeding where the court appoints a guardian to exercise the rights of a person that has been found to be incapacitated. And I will define what incapacity means under the law so you have a better understanding of that. But a guardian is either going to help someone with their property and their assets and their debts and their financial affairs, or they are going to assist someone with their personal care um, and uh, decisions about their health care and other matters that have to do with the person of the work, or both. So we're going to talk about different kinds of guardians, and sometimes a guardian is responsible for both the property and the person of the work. Um, the law in Florida that lays out everything that has to do with guardianship is Florida 744.101. And before it goes into the details of how to establish a guardianship, it does state that the preference is for the least, least restrictive form of guardianship. So as we'll see in just a minute, there are different levels of a guardianship, um, and the court is always going to try to find the least restrictive restrictive based on the needs and the abilities of the person that is found to be a ward of the court. The law says that the judge must give consideration to the individual's freedoms, choices, and needs. And the intent of the law is that guardianship is really supposed to be a last resort situation um, when it is necessary for either the personal or financial safety of the ward. So some terms that we'll be covering in the workshop today, I just touched upon what a guardian is. A guardian is a person legally appointed by the court to act on behalf of the ward, either their person, property, or both. A ward is the person who needs a guardian, the person that the court has found to be incapacitated. Um, and a ward can be either fully or partially incapacitated. So um, the court could find maybe because of a physical Restriction, the person needs assistance with some uh, responsibility for the person, but they are mentally sound, they are mentally not incapacitated, so they can still make legal, financial, and medical decisions for themselves, and that person could be found to be partially incapacitated, or it may be that somebody could be found to be fully incapacitated of the mind and the body, um, or it could, is not always an incapacitated adult, a ward could be a minor, um, and we'll talk in more detail about the circumstances in which a minor would need a ward instead of just a parent handling their affair. And then the third category, um, which is a developmentally disabled adult. And when we talk about guardian advocacy in a few minutes, that usually applies to developmentally disabled adults. So we often think of incapacitated ward as an elderly person. Um, and that is often the case, but um, a developmentally disabled adult could be 18, 18, 20, and still need assistance with their affairs. And what happens is, and in many of those cases, they had a parent that was assisting them with all these matters. But once they turn 18, then, you know, doctors, hospitals, other agents required something more than just, I'm their parent, because now they're an adult. And that is where guardian advocacy for developmentally disabled adults comes into play. 
So an incapacitated person is someone who the court has determined has the capacity to manage at least some of their affairs. And those are the three main categories we will see. You're either in, uh, incapacitated because of your age, you're a minor, incapacitated because of a mental or um, physical restriction, or a developmentally disabled adult. Um, I mentioned that you, you can have a guardian or a ward of the person or of the property. And I gave some examples, but property has to do with um, managing real property, such as a home. Um, it could just be something as simple as monitoring um, the receipt of somebody's social security benefits or of income that they be receiving or passive income. Um, capacity regarding the person has to do with can you manage your own health care affairs? Can you buy food for yourself? Can you upkeep your home? Um, care for your personal hygiene, et cetera. Just something to note in the state of Florida, when you file a petition for guardianship, you also file a petition to determine incapacity, unless it is for a guardianship of a minor or a guardian advocate. So if you are asking for a guardian of the person or the property to be um, assigned to an adult who you believe is incapacitated, you have to have a determination of incapacity by the court. So you will be filing simultaneously a petition for guardianship and a petition to determine incapacity at the same time. So now that we've covered some of the terms in general, um, I want to show you that there are all different kinds of um, guardianships that the court could be. You mentioned someone can be a guardian of just the person, just the property, or both. The court could appoint a limited guardian. So we're just going to appoint a guardian as it has to do with this person's fi finances or trust account and nothing else. Or a couple of um, the responsibilities of the board, but not all of them. And they would specify in the orders of the guardianship. So the court would order what's called a plenary guardian. A plenary guardian is responsible for all, um, either the property of uh, the responsibilities regarding property or person. Even in those cases, however, you will see um, that the orders that the court enters very specifically list the rights and responsibilities that are addressed by the guardianship. And in a few minutes, I will show you an example of those rights and responsibilities. Um, there, are, there are two types of guardians for a minor. Um, and we'll go into more detail in just a minute. Um, but there's the general guardian for a minor or a guardian over the settlement of a minor. There are advocates that has to do with developmentally disabled adults and um, each one of these categories, I'm gonna go into more detail with a separate slide. Sometimes there's an urgent matter that needs caring for immediately and someone may need to request an emergency guardian be appointed right away. So we'll discuss how you do that. There is something called a pre need guardian that actually just specifying who you would like a guardian to be in case something happens to you in the future. And then guardians come in different types, a non-professional guardian, which is a family member or a friend, professional guardians, and public guardians. We will discuss all of those in more detail in just a moment. So a limited guardian, as I mentioned, is appointed when a board has been found to be only partially incapacitated. The court will specify the scope of the powers and the responsibilities you most often see this in the context of some sort of physical incapacity with mental limitations, because usually if a ward is totally incapacitated of the and the body, a plenary guardian will be needed. Um, if a limited guardian is appointed and due to something like a physical incapacity injury and it is not a permanent state, the ward can petition the court. The ward can always petition the court to have their capacity restored and the guardian discharged. I mentioned that there are um, different types of guardians for a minor. Um, by nature of being under 18 and under laws of our country 
in our state, not being able to make certain decisions on your own. There is no finding of incapacity required if you would like to be the guardian because a guardian just by the, their age of minority is considered to have certain incapacities under the law. So it may be that someone needs a guardian of a minor appointed as a guardian of the person. That is usually means that parents are either incapacitated and cannot care for the child or are deceased or for some other reason are not being caretakers of the child. Then there could be a guardian of the person appointed to care for the child in the place of a parent. It um, is not permanent in nature like an adoption, um, but there are oftentimes long-term guardianships over a minor. Um, so if it's only of the person, they're caring for the child, shelter, healthcare, school, child does not have any property in their own name that needs to be administered, like a trust fund or an inheritance. Um, Sometimes the court appoints a guardian of a minor that is a guardian of the person and the property. So it would be the situation where this child did not have parents that could care for them. However, in addition to needing someone to care over their person, they do have property that was left to them or a source of income. Um, if, a, if a child is a celebrity or an actor or something to that effect and they receive income, then the guardian may need to manage their income until they're an adult and can manage themselves. Um, and finally, there is a kind of guardianship called guardian for a settlement of a minor. And this is limited to when a minor is receiving a settlement or reward from a lawsuit. So let's say the minor was in an accident and there was a personal injury lawsuit filed on behalf of the minor. And the child has parents that are caring for them, but uh, the law in Florida says that if they're going to receive a settlement and it is over $15,000, a guardian has to be appointed uh, over the management of that case and the settlement of that um, money that the child is going to receive. The guardian can be the parent if the settlement is for less than $15,000, but if it is for more than $15,000, the court the court appoints someone who is not the parent of the child. Um, then there are guardian advocates. Guardian advocate is a unique aspect of guardianship law. It is specifically for developmentally disabled adults. Um, it is unique in several senses. It does not require that the, there be a separate incapacity case and that the ward be required to be found incapacitated. But the guardian advocate statute does say that the person has to lack the decision-making ability to do some but not all of the tasks necessary to care for themselves or to care for their property. And it has to be specifically due to a developmental disability. And some examples that are given are autism, Down syndrome, um, cerebral palsy. Um, and as I mentioned, usually when you see a guardian advocate, it is someone that has had this developmental disability since birth or young age, but it does not become an issue until um, they become an adult. And so you often actually times see this being filed by parents um, when the child is 17 years old and you know, close to their 18th birthday. Um, it can be, it, it was envisioned to be, I, I see a lot of orders what's up, but it was envisioned to be less restrictive than a guardianship for a person who's been totally incapacitated. So you, you can sometimes see a guardian advocate where the, where the ward um, still has the right to work and generate income, um, vote, and things of that nature. Those rights are oftentimes not taken away in a guardian advocacy. The court must specifically state in the order what rights have been given to the guardian advocate and which are retained by the developmentally disabled adult. Um, as we will discuss in just a moment, in 99% of guardianship cases in Florida have to be initiated by an attorney uh, under Florida law, but the statute for guardian advocate says it does not have, require representation by an attorney. There are um, pre-made forms in the state of Florida for guardian advocacy, so someone could file it on their own by an attorney. Um, I, do, I will reference some agencies that assist with this, however, if you would like an attorney to assist you with the guardian advocate process, 
um, I will give you some information about that at the end of the presentation. Um, as we'll talk about in just a few minutes, normally guardians have a lot of requirements for trainings they have to attend, annual educational requirements that they have each year. Um, but a lot of times you'll see in the guardian advocate situation, if it's a parent who is just continuing to care for this child that will still need parental care as an adult, that the court could waive some of those requirements um, in the order of guardian advocacy. Another type of guardianship that we mentioned is the emergency temporary guardian. So it might be that if you're filing a petition for guardian, you also need to file a petition for an emergency temporary guardian because um, appointing a guardian is not an overnight process, right? As I mentioned, filing a petition for incapacity at the same time. So the court has to work through the process of determining whether the person is incapacitated first. So they will appoint an um, examining committee. Um, the individual will be interviewed and examined. People will look into their situation. Um, and uh, there will be medical professionals that will be involved and make recommendations to the court. Um, and then the guardianship case can move forward. So the process could take several weeks or months um, to get a permanent guardian in place. So if there's some emergency situation that requires immediate attention or the person's physical or mental health or safety or their finances could be in peril, you can request that the court appoint an emergency temporary guardian for up to 90 days. And then the law does also allow you to request if the regular case is not finalized yet, that the court could extend the emergency guardian's um, authority for an additional 90 days. I would recommend if you think there's an emergency situation in your um, case that you consult with an attorney and also that you review the statute, that Florida statute, um, chapter 744 that I mentioned at the beginning, because it does define what is considered uh, an emergency. I kind of summarize it here that it's imminent danger of the person's physical or mental health or danger that their property is going to be wasted or misappropriated. But the statute goes into uh, more detail as what the court can consider an emergency and what we have to consider. Um, finally, I mentioned that there's something called a prenatal guardian. A prenatal guardian is defined in Florida statute 744.3045, but it's basically when you are in your sound mind, but you may have a concern that one day you may not, you may be mentally or physically incapacitated. The law does allow you to determine when you're in the sound mind who you would like your guardian to be. So you can draft something called a need guardian. Um, it has to be in writing sign it in the presence of two witnesses and at the same time those two witnesses have to be present and sign it as well and you would file it with the clerk's office we do not have a fee for you to file this um, you're basically depositing it with the clerk's office um, if you in the future should become incapacitated and a guardianship is filed um, on behalf the pre need guardianship form creates a rebuttable presumption that whoever you specified in your pre guardianship form should be the guardian of the court appoints. You can actually, under Florida law, file this for yourself and or for your minor children. So um, oftentimes people think about in their will, they want to specify should something happen to them, who would care for their children. But what a pre need guardianship does is handle the situation where you may be alive, um, but it be incapacitated. It allows you the opportunity to um, express who you would like to fulfill that role in that unique situation. Finally, um, I mentioned that there are non-professional and professional guardians. Um, a non-professional guardian is a relative or a friend or someone who knows the ward and is offering to serve as their guardian. A professional guardian usually does not have a relationship with the ward that they are appointed to. They are not relatives. 
Uh, professional guardian is defined under the law as someone who has three or more wards assigned to them by the court that are not relatives. They can be private or public. Um, uh, a public guardian is usually um, for a ward who is of limited financial means, a private uh, guardian, a private professional guardian can be paid from the assets, the, the estate of the ward, but a public guardian um, usually does not have the funds to pay for a private professional guardian. Um, so there are nonprofit guardianship guardians um, in Palm Beach County, like Legal Aid and um, Jewish Family Services, you know, Catholic Charities in some counties um, that help be guardians for low-income individuals. Um, professional guardians and public guardians are regulated by um, the Office of Public and Professional Guardi Guardians, which is a subset of the Department of Elderly Affairs. So um, they will have some additional requirements that a relative or a friend or a family member who's serving as a guardian for just one individual may not have. And we'll go over those requirements um, just momentarily. But um, a professional public guardians are, are more regulated by the state. They have some additional education um, and financial requirements that they must keep up to date. And as I mentioned before, I just want to reiterate that unless you're filing a guardian advocacy and you're not an attorney, you must be represented by a Florida attorney to file a guardianship case. Um, if you're not a Florida attorney, as I mentioned, there are some uh, nonprofit legal agencies um, in the state of Florida and in Palm Beach County that assist with these types of cases. So we talked about the different types of guardians, but you may be wondering, am I eligible to be a guardian? So who can be a guardian in the state of Florida? Well, you have to be at least 18 years old. Um, sometimes you may have heard, you know, the TV or the news, that a, that a sibling becomes the guardian for their younger siblings if something happens to their parents. Um, but they, that sibling must at least be an adult, so they have to be at least 18 years old. And normally you have to be a resident of the state of Florida if you wanna be a guardian over someone who lives in the state of Florida. The statute does make some exceptions. Um, it can be a non-resident if the guardian is related to the ward. Um, by lineal consanguinity. I always have trouble with that word, but it basically, I define it here for you. So it would have to be uh, lineal means up or down, right? So a, chi uh, a child, a parent, a grandparent, um, a grandchild. And then it also includes an adoptive child or an adoptive parent. And then the statute says that you do not have to be a Florida resident if you are the spouse, brother, sister, uncle, aunt, nephew, or niece. So you know, it, it goes in the lateral direction as well. Um, or somebody who's related by uh, that word that I love to say to any such person. So it could be um, the parents of a spouse or the child of a spouse um, as well. Um, or the spouse of any person listed above. So those are the exceptions when they would not have to be a resident of the state of Florida. There's a preference for the person to be a resident of the state of Florida just because of uh, proximity to the person that whose finances or whose physical well-being they are caring for. Um, so that is um, a general summary of who can be a guardian. Um, if you have any doubts, I would visit Florida statute that I referenced there, 744.309, for a full list of who may serve as a guardian. That statute also tells you who cannot serve as a guardian. But I will give you some examples here, um, which are the most common um, barriers that come up. Um, convicted felons cannot serve as guardians. Persons who suffer from certain illnesses or are incapacitated themselves, um, so they may be mentally sound but physically incapacitated or may not be able to serve as a, um, as a guardian, um, especially if it's a guardian of the person, not just of the property, which may require um, assisting the Lord with some physical responsibility. 
any person who was determined by a court to have committed abuse, abandonment, or neglect against a child or against an elderly person. Um, any person who has a conflict of interest with the ward, and there are some exceptions, but basically, um, if you have, um, it's, if the ward owns a business and you own stocks in that business, uh, normally you would not be an appropriate person to be appointed the guardian of the right health. Or you're a vendor that works through their business on a regular basis, something to that effect or some examples. Once again, you can visit the statute for a full detailed list of who may not serve as a guardian, but these are the most common situations that um, people ask about and we see. To be a guardian, there are some requirements under the law. You have to post a bond and um, the amount of that bond depends on the statute, the case, whether you're a professional guardian or a non-professional guardian and on what the court orders. Um, if you are a professional guardian, you have to receive a minimum of 40 hours of approved instruction on how to be a guardian, and, um, and then a minimum of 16 hours of continuing education every two years. So if you're a professional guardian, this is your job, and it has those requirements. If you're a non-professional guardian, like a friend or a family member who's applying to be a guardian or just this one person, um, you still have to take eight, eight hours of court approved course on how to be a guardian and you have to complete it within four months of your appointment. All guardians are required to have a credit check done um, as well as a background check. It is a regular uh, first level background check for a non-professional guardian who is a family member or um, other relationship to the ward. Um, a pro a professional guardians have a higher level background check, a two level background check um, that they are required to have conducted. So you will have to be fingerprinted. Um, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement is going to do a background check if you would like to be a guardian of any type. Um, for non-professional guardians, the court can waive or reduce some of these requirements under the law, particularly the educational requirements. So I mentioned before that the powers of a, of a ward, they mirror the rights, uh, the powers of a guardian mirror the rights of a ward. So the guardian has powers to exercise the rights of a ward if those rights have been specifically taken away by the court. And in the court's orders, they have to be very specific. They actually list what rights have been retained by the ward and what rights have been taken away. And there are some rights that even if they're taken away from the war because they don't have the capacity to execute that right, they're still not assigned to a guardian. So that's what this chart is here to assist. So certain rights, like the right to apply for government benefits, to manage money and property, to determine where they're gonna live, to consent to medical and mental health treatment, to make decisions about social environment, to enter into a contract and to file a lawsuit. Those are rights that can, they're not always taken away from the ward, but can be taken away from the ward and assigned to their guardian as a delegate, delegate to do on their behalf. There are some rights that can be taken away from a ward, although they're less, less common, such as a right to marry, to vote, apply for a driver's license, travel, seek and retain employee employment that could be taken away from a guardian, but they're not assigned, I mean, from a ward, but they're not assigned to a guardian. So for example, if the right to marry is taken away from a ward, it's, it's not assigned to a guardian to decide, well, I would like them to marry this person or I to approve that they marry this person. Um, so some rights can be um, removed from court but not delegated to a guardian and some can be removed from the court and delegated to a guardian. Um, so order will specify, for example, the right to vote. It's, it's, it's rare that that right be taken away from someone. Um, and if it, it has to be specifically stated in the order, but you may have a guardianship that um, lists all of these rights except the right to vote or the right to travel. 
and then it would not have those listed. So you're going to want to look at um, the specific orders and letters of guardianship for that case to know what the circumstances are for a particular individual. So it's a case by case determination that the court is making. It's not a one size fit all. And remember that the law says that um, the court should try to make it as restrictive as possible, depending on the type of incapacity that the person has. Um, but some are some people that are uh, completely mentally and physically incapacitated. Um, and those would be the most extensive ones that you would see. Um, in addition to powers, guardians also have responsibility. So the statute lists the duties of a guardian. Um, in general, the duty of a guardian is to manage the delegated of the ward in the best interest of the ward and as much as possible consistent with the consequences of the ward. So if the ward has mental capacity, then the guardian should execute their preferences and their wishes. If the ward does not have mental capacity, then the guardian has to um, make decisions that are in the best interest of the ward. And they might be the best interest physically, um, and mentally, emotionally, if they're a guardian of the person responsibilities, or they can be in their best interest financially if what they're managing is their finances and their um, assets and their income and their benefits. So the clerk's office is tasked with um, auditing various reports that guardians are required to do every year to make sure that everything is in order. And then the court is required with approving these plans and accounts and um, inventory to make sure that the wards matters are being handled um, correctly and responsibly by the guardian and that there's no type of fraud being conducted. Um, Florida, so I'm sure you've seen that oftentimes there are headlines in the news, elder abuse of uh, a guardian abusing a minor. So um, we take it very seriously here in Palm Beach County, in addition to having a guardianship auditing team which audits everything filed by the guardian, um, we have an inspector general's office that has a guardianship unit that handles any of the audits when there's any red flags of misconduct or fraud. And they have the authority under Florida to do more thorough investigations, um, subpoena witnesses, et cetera, to make sure um, that the ward is not being financially or in many other way abuse for them. So how, how do we do this? Well, guardians are required to file numerous different documents under Florida law. When they first become a guardian, they have to file an initial plan saying, uh, where is the ward gonna live? Where are we now? Is anything gonna change? So they have to go through all the different um, aspects of the ward's well-being. Uh, depending on if it's just the person or the property. It's also a guardian of the property. They will have to do an inventory. I'm just joining as the guardian over this ward right at the beginning. This is everything that I was able to identify that they own. Okay, so it's an inventory of things as they are when the case starts. But then every year, um, if they're a guardian of the person, they have to do an annual plan to reflect any changes or needs uh, or additional um, things that have happened to the ward. And every year they will have to do an annual accounting where um, they elaborate any expenses that came out of the ward's finances, any purchases made, any changes, any loss, gain of income or assets. And so every year the guardian auditors are going to compare the accounting from this year to the previous year and make sure there are no discrepancies, everything is accounted for. If they spend a certain amount of money, they need a court order, giving them permission to do so, et cetera. So they're going to go through everything with a fine tooth claim. And then the guardian is discharged, either because they can no longer serve as a guardian and they have asked that we place them with someone else, or because the ward has passed away, they are to do final report in accounting um, to explain where things are at the end of their term. Uh, it would be necessary to either assist with the next guardian that will be appointed, or if the ward is to assist with any probate actions that may be required. 
being a guardian is not easy. <laughs> um, it's something that is necessary, but guardians do have a lot of responsibilities and they do have financial um, reporting and annual reporting that they are required to fulfill under the law every year in a timely manner. So at the beginning of the workshop, I mentioned that there are alternatives to guardianship. Um, as the clerk's office, we cannot give you advice as to which of these is better for someone that you're concerned about. So if you're not an attorney, you may want to consult with an attorney who has expertise in this area to see what would work best for your particular situation. My job is to just let you know that there are alternatives that might work. And all of these alternatives are less restrictive than a guardianship. And so they may not be enough for some people, um, but they may be in some situations. So sometimes the person can still make decisions, but they just need help. We don't want to take away the right to make decisions. We want them to help them. So um, there are um, supportive decision-making agreements that can be entered and can even be filed with the court um, to specify someone that's going to assist the person, but not take over. Um, different banks may have financial services um, that may assist um, individuals with managing their finances. A lot of people are familiar with or have heard of power of attorney. A power of attorney does not require you to file a court case, but there are legal requirements what the document must include, the witnesses, whether it must be notarized. And those documents are official documents that have to be recorded in the official record. Um, but a power of attorney gives the person who holds it limited power. It's not as expensive as a guardianship. It does work with some outside agencies, some financial agencies, some agencies, but there are others that would require a court order, a court order guardianship. Um, there are healthcare advanced directives. So if really what you want is make sure that if you become incapacitated, someone can make um, decisions about what medical treatment you receive or how long you would receive medical treatment. You may run into things like healthcare advanced directives or medical proxies. Um, it's oftentimes for young adults or people who are incapacitated through some mental or uh, developmental or any reason really, it doesn't even require a disability. Oftentimes, um, a, a trust can be um, set up where there is a um, trustee distributes the funds to the beneficiary and manages it and makes sure um, that the best interests of the beneficiaries are looked out for financially. There are different kinds of trust, revocable, irrevocable, special needs. If you're not sure if this would be a good situation for you or your loved one, uh, and I would recommend again that you consult with an attorney to talk about um, what it entails to set up a trust, to be a trustee, to be a beneficiary under the trust. But oftentimes, I think of this list, that is the one seen most often um, when it comes to managing and assisting your finances. Um, I mentioned that we have some helpful resources. This is all available on our website and they're actively there. But um, for parents of developmentally disabled teens, if you're thinking you need guardian advocacy assistance, there is a very extensive, wonderful website called turning18.org. Um, it can connect you to assistance with filling out the forms. Um, and um, our wonderful team is putting the links in um, the chat box. So if you actually want to click on any of the links now, um, you could. Um, so um, the Turning 18 is uh, the labor of various organizations, kind of like this um, last website, the Florida Court Guardian, um, the Setsing University, um, different, different um, uh, nonprofit and professional guardianship associations um, have all this information. So if you're the parent of a developmentally disabled teen and you kind of don't know where to start, turning18.org would be a good place. Um, if you really aren't in the place where you can be a guardian, but you're concerned about an elderly person, and that some fraud is being, um, you know, 
happening to them, someone is committing fraud against them. There is a hotline you can call the Department of Elder Affairs hotline, which is listed there on the slide um, shown. Um, I list our website. We have a guardianship page on our homepage. If you go to departments and you click the guardianship, um, and that guardianship page is going to tell you how to contact the clerk's guardianship division. Um, maybe you are a guardian or an attorney for a guardian and have questions about some correspondence that you got about an audit. Or um, if you're just beginning the process and you have questions about the filing fees, where we're located, how you can file a guardianship, all of that is located on our website. Um, on the self-service page of our website is where all of our monthly workshops are, and that's where you can find this PowerPoint and um, pretty soon this video as well. Um, I've referenced a lot of statutes in today's presentation. They're all part of Chapter 744 of the Florida Statutes. And so here's a link if you want to read them in more detail. That's quite extensive. I've tried my best to summarize them for you today to give you a general overview. Um, but it would benefit you to read them in more detail to see if any of the exceptions that I've mentioned apply to your situation. And then lastly, this last website is the Florida Court Guardianship Stakeholders website. It has so many resources, not only for just concerned loved ones, but for people who are interested in becoming a guardian, whether it be non-professional or professional. Um, and it is a collaboration, as I mentioned, of Stetson University, um, the Office of Professional Guardians, and, and several other uh, nonprofit organizations and justice partners. It, it is a, also a very good place to start if you believe that someone that you know needs a guardianship or if you're interested in becoming a guardian. So I've talked at you for a very long time. I know this workshop has a lot of information, but um, I hope it's given you a better understanding of um, what it means to be a guardian, what it means to be a ward, and the whole guardianship process here in the state of Florida. I'm going to open it up. I don't currently see any questions in the chat, but I'm going to open it up to see if anybody has any questions that you'd like to ask. Um, and I do think I see one hand raised. Alicia, I'm going to unmute you in a second so you can ask your question. Okay. Hi. Um, Good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for this presentation today, by the way. No problem. Um, my question was that you mentioned earlier that um, there are certain, I believe, like laws this, that will, um, in a sense, still show that even though the person may be over 18, that they still have a disability of like some yes. non-age. Yes. Um, so with that being said, if the person's parent is still alive, they would be the ones that would have to like request to remove the disability of non-age and would a guardian need to be appointed or at that point that that's done, um, you know, doing the whole process through the courts, um, a guardian doesn't have to be appointed okay. after, I kind of so asked like two questions in one. Sure, so, so the person has turned 18 is what you're saying. Yeah, over the over the age of eighteen. The, over the age of eighteen, do they still have some sort of uh, developmental disability? No, no. Okay, so if if they so the court would not get involved unless somebody asked them to, uh, uh, unless so if if the guardian if the minor had a guardianship before they turned eighteen, just because of their age, to oversee property or a settlement. And once they turn 18, then yes, that would be removed. The, you, um, there would be a petition for discharge and they would no longer have to be under a guardianship. Um, that wasn't really the question. The question okay. was, um, yeah, I, was, I asked two questions in one. So pretty much what I was saying was, um, you said that there are certain laws that will have um, even someone who's over the age of 18 to be considered still a minor if they don't go to court to remove the um, disability of non-age. No, there's no, there's, they would not, that I'm aware of, there are no laws or statutes that would say someone over 18 would still be considered a minor. It's just sometimes someone over 18 
if they have a developmental disability, could still be considered incapacity, incapacitated, even though mm -hmm. they are no longer a minor. And that would require someone to bring that to the court's attention by filing something like a guardian advocacy. But if the if a minor is not developmentally disabled and no one files anything when they turn 18, then the court would not get involved and, and nothing would have to be filed to remove that and them just mm. move on to being a normal adult. I was only the only circumstance where someone would still be considered incapacitated was if they had some sort of developmental disability and someone filed something with the court. Okay. Yeah, because I was reading like the statutes prior to this, just to get kind of like, you know, a brief. Um, so I did go over like the statutes that you were reading, but I also uh, saw that there was a statute of um, non-age of uh, disability um, or disability of non-age. And it said something about um, one would have to go to court to have that disability removed, even if we reach the age over 18. So that's why I kind of wanted to know like, um, well, we need to have a guardian once we do that, but you're saying that that process doesn't need to be done. So that's all I'm, I was just kind of like, correct. And I think someone just put it in, in, in the chat. So if a minor um, has a develop, uh, I'll answer your question, then I'll answer the chat question. Um, uh, no, so, so I understand what you're saying. Correct. That, I, it really, it, that really is only speaking to someone who, uh, what they mean by non-age is that they're not incapacitated because they're elderly. So it's actually not referring to a minor. It's if someone has uh, have been found incapacity not due to their age, not because they're elderly, maybe they have dementia or something, and the court found them to be incapacitated, the only way to remove that is to go back to the court and ask them to restore capacity. So when the statute mentions non-age in that context, they're saying their incapacity, their disability, whatever reason the court found them to need to be a ward um, had nothing to do with their age. And the regular process that happens sometimes to your mind or your body when you get older. If you have a non-age related incapacity, um, you, you have to file something with the court to have your capacity restored. Um, but then okay. I also see a question Incorrect. Missy is correct. So everyone, once you turn 18, is considered adult. You, you don't have to, um, the court doesn't get involved unless you petition the court for guardianship. Um, Missy said it perfectly in the chat. Um, I see there's a question. If a minor has a developmental disability, would you have to do a guardianship for a minor first? Not if you're the legal parent. So if you're the legal parent of a child, um, you already have rights to care for them, even whether they're disabled or not. Um, so it really only becomes an issue once they turn 18. And then, you know, I, I hear stories and someone is basically saying, I've always taken my kid to the doctor and done all the talking for them. They're developmentally disabled. They can't really speak for themselves. But now they're 18 and the, and the doctor's office is saying that they need a court order for me to be able to do this. So this is for an adult. An adult does not need a guardianship to care for the minor child if they're not the parent, but if, I mean, if they are the parent, but if they're not, they may need a guardianship. So I see that you're saying this is for an adult caring for a minor child, the parent is out of the picture. So yes, I mean, there are, there are, for example, there is something that you can file in family court if you are related to the minor. That's called temporary custody of an extended family member. But it, it is more limited than a guardian. It does not give all the rights that a guardianship gives. It may work in a limited capacity. You know, sometimes you see it if one parent is in the military and, they, and they're the primary caretaker that they agree to do this temporary custody of an extended family, the uh, family member. It is not as extensive as a guardianship. A guardianship would definitely give the non-parent more rights. You may want to compare them and speak with an attorney to determine which one would be best. But if it is a minor, even if they're not developmentally disabled, if you're not the parent and you want to act in place of the parent, then yes, you would normally need to follow guardianship. Um, it, Missy is saying she's an aunt who recently received temporary custody of a minor. It is easier, not necessarily cheap. It's definitely easier because you don't need an attorney to file it and you don't have those annual reporting requirements. It's just 
it's not as extensive. So it just depends on who you're dealing with. Um, definitely, if the child has some sort of financial income, inheritance, or something like that, a guardianship may be required. Um, if it's just making decisions at school and with the doctor, the temporary custody may be sufficient. You, you basically not only want to get some legal advice, but you'll want to talk to who you're going to be interacting with to see if they'll accept the temporary custody order or they would require a guardianship for whatever role that you're taking for that minor child. Yes, and it is much easier for the temporary custody if you can get consent from the parents. That is correct, because otherwise the parents will have to be served with the, the legal people. Any other questions? I have a question. <laughs> yes. Missy, hi. hi Missy. Um, as you can tell, I've been through everything. I've been through yes, guardianship and temporary custody. Yes. And so I kind of been through all the system, but my issue is with the reporting. That's the one that throws me off, the guardianship reporting. Reports. Yes. Because I find it's either, I'm not sure when it's due, and um, and then how to submit it. Like I, you, it was just, I tried it so is, hard to do it online. It seemed it like there was a process should have yes. been easier since I've been, this is, you know, I've been reporting uh, for my son now for quite a few years. And uh, I don't know if the process has been streamlined or, or you know, what? it's it's actually statutorily defined. So we don't have discretion um, as to, um, you know, when it's due and, and it's not easy. <laughs> but um, in a case where you're the parent and sometimes you can file something um, to request that the court waive some of those requirements, the reporting requirements and see if the judge would be willing to do that if you're the parent of the child, especially if you've already submitted several reports um, and there has been nothing, you know, that's been questioned or you haven't had any problems with it. Normally what the law says, it's due a certain amount of days from when you're appointed. And then every year it'll be due on the same date that following year. However, sometimes the court modifies the order appointing the guardianship. So let's say, and I don't have the statute in front of me, but let's say your first initial report is due 90 days from when you've been appointed the guardian. And then from that deadline, every year it's gonna be due on that date, that 90th day, you know, every year it's going to be due one exactly one year later. However, if the court makes an order modifying, adding a co-guardian, extending um, the deadline, then you have to remember the following year to count from that new deadline. Um, if you miss the deadline, the court's guardianship auditors will send the note letting you know. Oh yeah, I received that, that one. <laughs> so they will remind you, and then we don't automatically the next week send it up to the judge and say this person is yeah. delinquent. We'll send you a reminder, and we'll wait another thirty to sixty days, depending on what you still need to submit, letting you know that um, it's past due and that you need to get it into us. So you will get a reminder, and there will probably actually be a lot of back and forth until you get it just right. Um, this, we have to follow the statute. The statute requires receipts and, and doctor's notes, and, and it's very extensive, the reporting requirements. So um, something to think about if you're deciding that you want to do a guardianship versus a, a temporary custody, um, if, if that's an option to you, which is only an option for minors. Once somebody is an adult, the temporary custody is not an option. Right, right. Okay, but we don't have any flexibility. What I will tell you is, um, so how, how it's submitted, um, it, it, it needs to be filed. If you're represented by an attorney, they will have to e-file it electronically through the Florida e-filing portal. If you're in one of those cases where an attorney is not required and you don't have an attorney, then you can file it by mail or in person, but you can also still e-file it if that's more convenient. But sometimes there will be supporting documentation that's required that you will have to mail into our office um, if you cannot electronically find. Okay. All righty. And you know what? You can give our guardian department um, at our main branch courthouse in West Palm Beach. That's where our auditors are located. Mm -hmm. if you're not sure when it's due. You can give them a call. They'll walk. Oh, I do. I, I usually end up emailing them or calling them and going, I'm so sorry. What is this due again? And everyone's been okay. really good about responding. They're happy to let you know when it's due. No problem. They keep a calendar because they have on top of when everybody's right. is due. So they will be happy to share that information. with you. Anyone else have any questions? No? 
don't see any hands raised at this time. Um, if you think of a question, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can email us at self-service at mypalmbeachcourt.com. Um, and they are happy to forward that email to me if um, they're on the answer. I know some of my team is on the call and I know guardianship is something that because you're required to have an we, we are, are unable to help much in the self-service center. Like if we don't have guardianship packets because you are required to be represented by an attorney unless you're doing a guardian. But we can give you information. That's why we hold these workshops. Um, and I'm always happy to answer any emails if you have any um, questions that came to your mind after the presentation. So Monica, I'm gonna unmute you so you can ask your question. Um, or maybe Caitlin, you can unmute her because I'm not successful. There we go. Uh, good, good afternoon. Thank you so much for uh, having this session for folks on guardianship. Um, I'm a professional guardian and I did start out as a family guardian. Okay. Uh, I just wanted uh, just to point out for, for actual information that after you take the 40 hour professional guardianship course, there is a very stringent and challenging test that you do have to pass um, before then you can apply to the OPPG, as you mentioned, to become a professional guardian. So I, I just wanted to make that clear because so I don't want folks thinking, oh, you just go take a class and then, you know, yeah. So in addition to the bond and the background check and the educational requirements, there's also a test. Yes, after yes, after you take the 40 hour initial education test there, or excuse me, course, there is a test administered by the University of South Florida. And there are scores uh, that you have to get before you would be considered passed. And then once you do that, then you have to submit your application, your level two background check, all your credit reports, et cetera, et cetera, um, to the Office of Public and Professional Guardians before um, they will consider, uh, you know, making you a professional guardian, so. Excellent, I will definitely add that to the presentation for the next time, thank you for letting me know. Oh, no um, problem. But I think this was very helpful because a lot of times we do get a lot of calls from the public asking, uh, you know, about how do I become a family guardian or what can I do for my uh, developmentally disabled person. So that's why I attended. I, I wanted to make sure what I, the information I shared with folks when they did call me and ask is what you are. So thank you so much for this. Oh, no problem. And thank you for sharing your experience as well. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Please stay tuned. Um, we, we will have another workshop next month. And um, in about a week or so, we will have determined what the topic will be. And we'll share it on our website and all our social media outlets. Um, thank you so much for joining us. If, like I mentioned, if you have any questions, feel free um, to reach out to us. And um, we're happy to assist. Everybody have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.